Well, you ought to be a little more excited than that. Amen. <laughs> it is good to know that we are loved by God. You know, my wife asked me the other day, about a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact, uh, what are you preaching on that Sunday before Thanksgiving? She knows that I hardly ever preach seasonal or kind of sermons, hardly ever. We're usually in the middle of a series or a book or something like that, so I don't always kind of gravitate to a topical message in regard to the seasons. If I do, it's usually at Christmas time. We're doing some basic word studies on, that, that, that unlock more of what Christmas is really all about. But uh, this Thanksgiving, I'm actually preaching a sermon on Thanksgiving. So I uh, don't know if it's just the sovereignty of God or what's happened here, but whatever it is. I think it's important that we talk about it, but not just in the context of a holiday. There's a great emphasis these days to call it Turkey Day. Well, we're not doing Turkey Day. And the thing about Turkey Day, it's followed by Black Friday. Yeah. Is that kind of like when the stock market crashes or what? You know, <laughs> heard of Black Monday or whatever it is. But uh, no, we're going to talk about Thanksgiving in the context of what it is, generally with Thanksgiving. And not in, in the, in the uh, I would say, the, the, the relevance to the holiday itself, but in regard to the, the action that we should have as part of our life of literally giving thanks to the Lord in all things. So I want to talk to you about that. And of course, I couldn't think of a more appropriate place to go to in Scripture than into the book of Luke where uh, the Lord is uh, walking in the way and uh, on his way to Jerusalem and he's met by some lepers as he enters a village on his way to Jerusalem. And so I want to look in Luke chapter 17. We'll have it up on the screen for you if you'd like. It says in verses 11 through 19, while he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him, and they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he'd been healed, he turned back glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, You stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Now, that is so typical of the culture that we are especially in today and that we find ourselves in. There's just not a lot of thanksgiving nor a lot of gratitude that is really ex expressed. And I said, even in regard, we talk about a thanksgiving holiday, which was originally and intentionally set aside to giving thanks to our Creator for the many blessings that He's given us. People have tried to revert that to, and I've seen even articles here recently in regard to it, not really saying anything about giving thanks to God, but thanks to each other. Let's appreciate each other. Let's appreciate those around us. And well, let's, we need to do that as well. But ultimately, all gratitude, first and foremost, the priority of it is always to God our Father. He has done so much for us and blessed us in so many ways. We need to learn what, what real thanksgiving is all about. I've got a simple definition, basically. It says, thanksgiving is the act of expressing specific gratitude to God for the blessings He's bestowed upon us, but mostly to God because He is our God. That's first and foremost. Praise God that He is our God. Praise God there's none higher, none more glorious, none more majestic, nor mighty, nor more sovereign than Him. And we have this outward communication as well as this inward uh, desperation for Him and this inward love for Him. And we want to say to Him, we are grateful for all the things that you are to us and all the things that you have given to us. In fact, I believe one of the signs of a mature believer a mature Christian is someone who's learned what Thanksgiving's really all about and lives as an expression of Thanksgiving to God. Now, there's not, and you say, well, I don't know a lot of people like that. I mean, if you really stop and think about it, I don't know just a lot of people. But, I mean, listen, seriously, if we have been transformed by the grace of God, if God sent His Son, sacrificed His Son on the cross, that we might be changed and have a new relationship with Him, and then he says he makes us into new creations, and we discover as we read the description of these new creations that that new creation is a joyful being, someone who is uh, positive and grateful and bounds with blessing and glory and honor and praise to God. That's 
becomes kind of a, a high mark of salvation. I was before unthankful. I was before bitter. I was before sour, you know. But now Christ has done a work in my life. I'm a believer. I'm excited about God. I thank God for what he, I was on my way to hell. That's three yeses. <laughs> I was on my way to hell. I'm not bound for hell anymore. I've been changed. I've been saved. I've been delivered. I'm no longer what I used to be. Now, see how that just naturally uh, gives itself, if we realize those things, it gives itself to the whole attitude of gratitude, this whole attitude of praise. God now has made a change in my life. Someone said, you know, God lives in two places. He lives in the heavens, but he also lives in the heart of those who are humble and grateful. Are we humble? Are we grateful? Well, if there's anything we should see again as the life of a Christian, it ought to be that our lives are filled with, with a day-to-day -day spirit of thanksgiving. Psalms 92 says, It is good to praise the Lord and to make music to His name, to proclaim His love in the morning and His faithfulness at night. In other words, it's saying day and night we praise the Lord. Day and night we give glory to God. Day and night we're thankful to God. Paul wrote in Colossians a couple of times, brings reference to this. In chapter 2, verse 6, he starts talking about how our lives should abound in thanksgiving. What's your life abounding in? I mean, if there's something that's abundant out of your life, it ought to be thanksgiving. Colossians 4, 2, he goes on to say, you know, that uh, we are devoted to thanksgiving. And I know folks who get devoted to a lot of stuff, but I don't know a lot of folks devoted to giving thanks. Amen. And here he starts talking about a devotion of our life. And even in Philippians 4, he talks about it again. He says that we, everything we do, we do with prayer and we do with thanksgiving. Psalms 116, we read from there, we're to make, if you read the whole of Psalms 116, we're to make the very essence of our life the, uh, as, as an offering before God. That our life becomes a, a abundant with thanksgiving to the Lord. And you read the book of Hebrews, there's over and over as it talks about all the things that God has done for us. And it talks about the sacrifice, and it talks about the resurrection, and it talks about the lordship of Jesus. It always kind of keeps following through with this. There's this attitude of thanksgiving, that there's this spirit of thanksgiving that flows through the book. But the sad truth is that most people are not like this. The sad truth is that most Christians are not like this. And when it comes to praise and adoration and thanksgiving, many believers fall way short of that when it really ought to be a hallmark in their life and it ought to be a, a, a real obvious sign of their life. It seems that we're a little better at grumbling. We're a little better at complaining than we are at giving thanks. Even despite all the blessings, if you stop and pause and you see all the blessings that God has bestowed upon us, there seems to be this same sentiment, everything but thankful. And obviously in, in Luke, or he's given the story of the, of the ten lepers that were cleansed. The, the nine lepers are, are a clear picture of where many people are today. They've experienced the grace of God on, on some level in their life, but there's still no real gratitude that comes out of that. They, they're standing there outside the village because they can't enter the village. They're crying out for, for God to do something. God does something, and they run off excited, and, but there's only one that returns. And the Lord says to him, where are the nine the other nine. Was no one found to return and do what? To give praise to God except this foreigner. And I believe Jesus is responding very clearly here and probably some, there's an element of emotional response to this uh, about the ingratitude of the nine believers. I believe there's, there's, a, there's this note of disappointment that people don't get it, that they don't understand what praise is all about. Now I really do believe that if we ever understood the context of what God does in the heart of somebody that learns this, and the heart of somebody that learns what praise is all about and learns to walk in a spirit of praise and adoration and thanksgiving before God, what God does as, as a result of that, I believe, is, 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 is bring grace, He brings joy, He brings freedom, deliverance, peace. And we could do just a study on, on the effects of thanksgiving and praise in our life, and it would show that what happens is there's a supernatural thing that God does in our hearts of just transforming and sometimes it's just out of pure faith. We just say, bless the Lord and praise the Lord. And we honor God and we give thanks to God. Psalms 103 says, Blessed be the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his blessings. Forget not all his benefits. But only one comes back to give thanks. A theologian who's written many commentaries by the name of William Barclay, he wrote this. He says, No story in all the Gospels so poignantly shows man's ingratitude like the lepers in Luke 17. The lepers came to Jesus with desperate longing, and he cured them. 
nine never came back to give thanks. Barclay goes on to say, so often, once a man has got what he wants, he never comes back. Isn't that a tragedy? When we get what we want, we don't come back. Does that have a tendency to resemble us today? We take God's goodness for granted, and so few turn around and say, Lord, thank you. Why, why are we that way? Why are we so inclined to just forget? It, we enjoy the blessing. We thank God for the gratefulness, but we just have this tendency to forget. Why do we not go back and say, thank you, God? I'm so glad you asked that. Let me give you a few reasons why I think we're so ungrateful and why we just don't get it many times. And I really believe the first of these has to do because of the Western hemisphere, the culture, the country, the nation that we're living in that has been so blessed by God. We are so ungrateful because, I believe, of affluence. We have been so blessed. First Timothy 6, Paul's writing Timothy and saying, listen, if you have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich, they fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. So we never learn what contentment is and therefore we never learn what gratitude is. We're never thankful for the basics. I, I remember reading the story after the, uh, not this election, but a couple elections back, with Charles Barkley, a former NBA star. Most of you know him. He's also a, a talk show and sports networks. And, you know, his mother was real upset with him because she found out that Charles had voted for George Bush. And she was rebuking him. She says, Charles, you know that George Bush is the rich people's president. To which he responded, Mama, we are the rich people. <laughs> Well, folks, you may not realize it, Republican or Democrat, you live in America, you are the rich people. You've been blessed. Some of you will, will go to lunch today and eat a meal that's probably fit for three people. And, you know, and it'll, be come, it'll come to your table or out of your house. It'll be served hot. There'll be more than one course. It won't be just rice or just beans and water. I mean, you're going to have a meal that is lavish. In, in any other part of the world, people would probably kill to have that meal. But so often we just, it's just part, you know, we just take it for granted. It's, you know, it's just, it's just our life. It's what we have. And we just don't realize how blessed we are. We travel by planes. We have cars. We live in, we live in air-conditioned homes. We have TVs. We have VCRs and computers and DVDs. We eat in nice restaurants. We, we worship in comfortable church buildings. We, we, just, we just forgot how blessed we really are. So I'm always amazed when we take people, these, these mission trips that we go on, who've never really been into a third world country, how blown away they really are. How many times that I've gone on these trips and on these mission trips, whether it's with young people or adults, they all seem to come to that same conclusion, we're blessed. Yeah. And many of them are literally moved to tears when they see the dire poverty that so many people live in. We're going into churches on Sunday mornings in some of these countries that don't have buildings. They have a little palapa roof over them. They try to stick a hundred or so people under a little hut. They don't have, they don't have air conditioning. They don't, they don't have electricity. They, you know, they, 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 they walk for miles in the rain sometimes just to get to church, and they're excited about it. They're praising the Lord. We have our pastor's conferences. As I said last week, we talked about our missions ministries and what we do in some of these third world countries. We, we bring these pastors into nice hotels and feed them big full course meals. And some of these people have never experienced that before. They don't have toilets in their homes. They have outhouses on many of them. They don't have toilets in their churches. They have outhouses, if you want to call them that. I've been in churches in Bulgaria like that. They didn't have toilets in the buildings. They don't have running water. And if they do, there's no hot water. And they're just, they're just astounded. You know, and they come to America and they see all the blessings or they come to some of these civilized areas, even their own country, and they, they see what, what we just so often just take for granted. Now, you would think that somehow everything we've been given would have a tendency to make us a little more grateful. And you'd think we'd probably be the most grateful people on the earth. But the affluence has somehow poisoned us. It was millionaire John D. Rockefeller when he was asked one time, how much money does it take to satisfy a man? His response was, just a little more. Just, just, just a little more. Gratefulness. And I think sometimes we are not grateful because of the affluence that we, we experience every day of our life. We just take things for granted. The second reason we're not grateful is that we, because of pride. 
Somehow we think that we, we have done this ourselves, that, we've, that, 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 that we, have, we have given everything. To our, we worked hard. We did this. It, I did this. It's all mine. And, you know, and, you know, I know that was a big issue. Remember in the election when we built this or you didn't build this kind of concept? We ran. Hey, the truth of the matter is God did. God's given you everything. God, the Bible says, He's the giver of good gifts. All good things come from Him. And ultimately, He's the author of all things, and He's sovereign. If you have something, you better realize it came because you were blessed. And God blessed you by giving you opportunities. God blessed you by giving you health. God blessed you by giving you a job. And so often, it's when we lose some of those things that we begin to realize just how blessed we really were. Why don't you take the time now to begin to recognize the blessings of God and thank God. Psalms 104 says, The pride in his wickedness does not seek God. In his thoughts there's just no room for God. Because we don't need God. We've arrived somehow ourselves. And that's just arrogance. That's pride. The third reason we become ungrateful is just because, I, I believe this is because bad relationships. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says that bad company corrupts good character. Some of you are hanging around the wrong people and they're ruining your life. You hang around people that are, that are just arrogant or perhaps they're ungrateful. That's the world we live in, all right? Let me just be honest with you. When, when you go to work on Monday, you're going to run into a lot of people that just are not thankful. They're going to gripe about everything. They're going to gripe about the boss. They're going to gripe about the job. They're going to gripe about the conditions. It's just all wrong. It's just, it's just complain, 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 complain. They're just, they're just been out of shape. When you go to the grocery store, it's somebody's, if he's just high prices, they're just terrible. I can, you're going to go to the gas station. I just can't believe gas me. It's just constant. Wherever you go, whether you're at the barber shop, the beauty salon, the nail salon, it seems that everywhere you go, there's just people that, you know, they're just like that. And, and it's hard to really find somebody that is just a thankful individual. I mean, they, they really are, have a clarity and an understanding that, you know, that, 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 that God's good. And we have blessings from God. Because when we go everywhere else, nobody seems to see that. So if you hang around people like that, guess what you become? If those people are your closest friends. Now, I've got a lot of good friends, and I've got a lot of people that would probably think they're my close friends that really aren't. You have something like that? And you don't get real close to them because they're just negative. Just everything about their life is like that. You, you know, how you doing today? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How's your wife? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's that job? Uh, yeah, yeah. How's the weather? Uh, it could be beautiful. Yeah, a little cool. Make my back hurt. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know what that does? You hang around that long enough. Well, it's the old, you know, lie down with dogs, you're going to get up with fleas. They'll be griping fleas, but you'll get them. <laughs> you'll be scratching along the rest of them, right? And it becomes, it's just because of bad relationship. But what happens in your life, another reason, which is the fourth reason why we're this way, is because that develops into a habit. And the ingratitude and the grumbling and the complaining become just as habitual to you as a, as a, as a crack addict. All right? It's just, it's just part of your life. It's, it's the way you respond to issues. Um, uh, there's people that come into church like that. It, it's just the way they, they live their, their, their lives. They've just picked up a habit of complaining years ago, and now it's just ingrained into their nature. And they complain. And it's easy when they get that, that, that sit, sitting in their life. It's all the time, about everything. You, even you go to church. You come in, you complain. I hope they don't sing too many of those hymns. Are too many of those contemporary songs today? Is it hot in here? I think it's too cold in here. If it's not hot, it's cold. Would you look at them sitting in that pew over there? Can you believe that? That preacher's probably going to go long, and I'm going to miss the kickoff. Uh -oh. oh, God forbid they're going to call a meeting right after church, a church meeting. And I'm going to have to stand in the long line at Luby's. Complaining it just comes natural, and it just easily develops. But you need to realize this: worse than all that, it's a sin. According to the Word of God, it's a sin. By the way, one last reason we, we become ungrateful is because of circumstances. It, you know, Ephesians says we're always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, even to God our Father. Sometimes we are in bad situations, and it's it's just the easiest thing to do when things are difficult is to complain about those things. I mean, you have a legitimate, difficult, critical situation going on in your life, and it's easy to lend yourself and move that direction. You cannot afford to do that. 
It's not going to take you anywhere that you need to live or reside or be. You've got to come to the place where, hey, you know, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to embrace this rejoicing attitude the Scripture talks about. I'm going to re- embrace the spirit of thankfulness, you know, that God has been good to me. And I know what the doctor said, and I know he used that C word, but, you know, God's bigger than the C word. God's bigger than all these things, you know. Or, you know it's, it's, it's hard to be thankful. If your son calls you on the phone and says, Dad, can you come get me? You run out of gas? No, I'm in jail. It's hard, you know, to, to be grateful when bills are coming in and, and the jobs are, are going out and the, and, and the income rate is cut down and, and the economy is bad. But that's the time when you need to be grateful. That's when the, you need to experience liberty in your life. Those are the times you need to walk in freedom in your life. And gratitude and praise and thankfulness will break those chains of despair in your life. So you need to move forward with that. You remember when Moses came out of, uh, of, of Egypt with the children of Israel and they crossed the Red Sea and there was rejoicing. But, you know, three days later, they're all complaining and they're murmuring about the water. And if it's not the water, it's the manna. If it, you know, it's manna this and it's got to have manna for breakfast. And man, where's the leaf? and where's the garlics and people complain about anything yeah. and you just miss life Exodus 14 10 says that Israel looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them and they said to Moses well was it because there was no graves in Egypt you brought us out here to die in the desert that sounds like something I would say has <laughs> just the right amount of cynicism in it you know just arrive at, and I, don't look at me like that. You know you'd probably say it too. Because we're, it's, it's, it's the first thing that seems to pop in our minds. It's the first reaction of the old man. But we are new creations in Jesus Christ. And we can stop that right at the core. And we can do something about it. You say, well, what can I do about it? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I'm going to give you four things you can do to transform yourself into a grateful person. And these will work if you're willing to do them. And there's biblical, basic disciplines in your life. I think number one is you just remember how much it pleases God, gratitude does. And how much it honors the Lord. It makes God happy. If you want an illustration of that, you can read that story in Second Chronicles with the dedication of the temple. And the people began to raise the voice. And, and they sang to the Lord. And they began to sing, He is good and His love endures forever. And the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud. And the priest could not perform the priestly services because of that cloud. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Why? People, people had done what the Lord had wanted them to do. They had accomplished His will in this situation. And then they followed it up presenting it to God with gratitude and praise and worship, and God was glorified, and God likes that. I think it's Jack Taylor says, praise looks good on you. It does. You adorn yourself, the Bible says, with a garment of praise. And so what do we do? I think we have to get back to this point and remember, hey, God is honored and God is pleased when we take the time to honor and bless and praise His name. And there's one key thing you find out from Genesis to the book of Revelation. If you want to get God's attention, you start praising. You start worshiping. You start adoring Him. But the second thing about you can do is you need to start avoiding complaining at all costs. When you compl- and it certainly may be a prayer like, Lord God, I don't want to be this kind of person. I don't want to be the person that complains about everything that's going on. I ask you in the name of Jesus to correct me when I start complaining. You live in me by your spirit. I pray you direct me when I start complaining. Numbers 11 talks about how the Israelites complained about the hardship, and when God heard it, his anger was aroused. Number one, what does it do? It pleases God when we praise him. What if we're not praising him? What if we're grumbling? He's not happy. He's angered. Psalm 77, the psalmist was talking about around verse 3 about when he started complaining. He said, when I began to complain, my spirit was overwhelmed. I do believe that's what happens. The more you complain, the more the door of despair is open. The more you whine, the more you grumble, the more of de- depression is welcomed. And so the more you complain, the more your spirit's going to be overwhelmed. But I believe the more you pray, the more your spirit's going to be lifted You draw nigh unto me, God says, I'll draw nigh unto you. How do we draw nigh unto you, to God? Well, we know the doorway to his presence is always an an offering and a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. That's that's the way to walk into freedom. And so you have to get to this place and say, I believe God. The Bible says in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, Give thanks in all things, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will. Psalm 77, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be living overwhelmed. 
I'd rather be over here in the, in the other aspect of life to enjoy the fullness of God and the presence of God because I am welcoming His grace and His presence by the attitude that I have of giving gratitude in my heart. So you have to, what, do you, what do you do at this point? To avoid complaining, you have to make a choice. You know? There's going to have to be some decisions. The Bible says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. And you read in Romans chapter 1, because they wouldn't give thanks, God, God just kind of let people go off and, and live in pride and live in arrogance. And you follow Romans chapter 1, you see how they get farther and farther and farther away from God until God just says, I don't have anything else to do with you. But what happens to those who welcome Him? What happens to those who give thanks to Him? It's just the opposite. We get closer and we get closer and we get closer to God. So what do we have to do? We have to come to the point and say, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to begin daily now to make this choice to be thankful to God. And it, it, it's, it's my little personal choice to rejoice. It's my personal decision to give Him thanks. It's my personal mindset right now to begin to live with an attitude that, that is, has gratefulness to God. What did Paul say? Rejoice in the Lord always. He wrote, and again I say rejoice. You've heard me say it before. He repeated it. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. He said it again for you Baptists that are in the room, all right? It's most of you. Why? Because people don't normally, naturally rejoice. We have to be told, and it doesn't be hurt to be told twice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again... By the way, I say rejoice. There it is, plain and simple. But this gets down to this attitude of doing everything without complaining and arguing that I can become blameless and pure, the children of God, without fault. What fault? If I'm just filled with complaining and grumbling, that's a horrible fault in my life. And a fault's basically an empty place. Nothing filling it. I don't want to be that. I want to be somebody who's experienced an ex the expression of God's mercy and grace from my lips to his, heart, to his ears. And out of that, what happens? I believe he exalts me and draws me. So I choose to be thankful. I choose to accept God. I give thanks in all things. Now, again, we talked about circumstances. Sometimes you're in some situations that are difficult. And it, it is a battle to say, I'm going to give thanks to God. But the Bible says to give thanks in all things. All right? Now, I think we'll come to the place, if we'll do that, when we see the full picture... How many times have you gone through some difficulty in your life and then you looked around and said, you know, if I hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't be here. And you start praising the Lord. What God's saying is, don't wait till you get to point B before you start praising and giving thanks. You praise Him at point A. I'm in a bad place. Things are difficult right now. Things aren't going my way. But hey, if God is on the throne and all things do work together for good, then I can praise the Lord and I can give thanks to God. So I'm going to give thanks in all things, even though I'm not real thankful feeling emotionally at this point. I will volitionally do something. Emotionally, I'm way behind this. Emotionally, I'm not anywhere near feeling good about this. But I can praise God, and I can give thanks. And I, I really do believe that, that when we get down the road, we will see how that all things did work together. So you realize that God is pleased when we praise Him. You begin to avoid complaining at all costs because you know that it does, it does not arouse God's uh, heart of appreciation, excitement, pleasure. It basically angers the, the Spirit of God. And I begin to make the personal choice to be thankful to God. And number four, I develop the daily discipline of giving thanks. And Daniel, you read in the book of Daniel about this great man who was just basically a slave who God raised up to be the second in power and authority in the nation. Amazing story. I mean, you talk about from nothing to everything. He's moved forward this whole time. But one of the, the traits about Daniel's life was, and it was, it was well known, he prayed every day, three times a day. Morning, noon, and night. The most important thing he could do is spend time with God. The most important thing he could do is turn everything over to God. The most important thing he could do would be praise God. And so he had established time in his life that he would make sure to carry out a discipline of realizing that God is on the throne and he's over all things. Even though he's in bondage to start with, a slave, he's been taken captive by the Babylonians, every day he's praising God. I think that's the kind of habits that we need to develop in our life, that we can get down on our knees. And like the old hymn says, you know, count your many blessings, name them one by one. It will amaze you, it will astound you, it will surprise you what the Lord has done. I believe that's true. And I believe that we can come to this place where we're willing to say, God, you know, I realize that my attitude stinks. And my complaining does not honor you. And it ruins my testimony. And it ruins my disposition. And it makes people around me miserable, as well as it makes me miserable. And I just don't want to be that guy anymore. <laughs> I just don't want to be that person anymore. And I realize it's going to take your Holy Spirit empowering me, living in me fully, 
But I need to realize, God, that the way I can experience that in my life is to enter into your presence with thanksgiving and praise. And that's where I want to start. And I will trust you, Lord God, that when I am not moving in that venue in my life, and I move over that little cloudy place of despair and misery, that you're going to correct me. And your Holy Spirit's going to point me back to the cross and point me back to Jesus and point me back to realizing how much I have been blessed and how many things I have to be grateful for. My prayer is that that's the attitude, not just on one day of the year, but it becomes our attitude as we live every day of every year. I want you to be glorified in my life. I'm tired of being the whiner and the complainer. I had one lady, in fact, after I preached this morning in the first service in Magnolia, she came over and she said to me, after she said, that's been my life. She said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a complainer, but I don't want to be that. What can I do? And my words to her says, you know, I think what you need to do is get radical about this. We are called as Christians to a war zone. All right? We're in a war zone. And we're constantly in battle. And you can't sit down and say, oh, I've got this need, and God showed me, a, God showed me this, this area, my character that's deficient, and, my, and, I, you know, and just kind of sulk about it and say, well, you know, God forgive me, and thank God for forgiving you because he does forgive us. But, and just sit there and take no actions. My word of counsel is there. I said, you need to take up the sword and run to the enemy. Run to the front line. Say, this is an area of my life that I'm going to work on by the grace of God. This is some. I said, start writing down Bible verses. Take some of these verses we share today. Write them down. Memorize them. Post them around your house. Post them in your car. Put them where you are at work. Put them on the dashboard. Put them on the refrigerator. So you're constantly reminded, just go to war over these things. Make a declaration right now. Say, this is where I'm moving, and this is what I'm going to do for the glory of God in my life. By the grace of God, and begin to do something about it. That's the way you deal with these th things in our life. That's the way you begin to make these corrections in your life. But I think number one, you say, how did that fir the first of these four steps was, I want to please God. And I don't want God to be displeased because my mouth is always spewing out bitter waters from a bitter fountain. I want to spring forth sweet waters because he's working in my heart and life. Starts first of all by knowing Christ as your Lord and Savior. If that's never happened, you really don't have any hope to start with. You, you can't praise the Lord you're not going to hell. <laughs> you really can't. Because the Bible says if you don't believe, you're condemned already. So the best thing for you to do is, is, is an about face. Turn to God. Turn away from yourself. The Bible calls that repentance. You turn from yourself, you turn from sin, and you turn to the Savior. And you welcome Christ into your life. And you become a follower of Jesus Christ. You're my Lord, you're my Savior. Now in that moment... Of decision and in that moment of that kind of repentance the Spirit of God will transform your life and he'll give you the desire and the power to do his will if you'll make that kind of decision if you're here as a Christian you don't need to write this off as some little deal you know well everybody does it you get serious about it say God this is this is not this Lord this is just ugly you know it's just ugly and I don't, I don't even like being around me <laughs> when I'm this way so I receive your reproof and your correction and your instruction. And I want to move forward with this and get aggressive about dealing with it in your life and develop an attitude of gratitude. Would you stand with me with our heads bowed? Scripture says in Hebrews 13, 15, Through him then let us continually offer sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips to give thanks to his name. And I think that should be an anthem as we go even into Thanksgiving Day and gather with our families, watch yourself. Don't find yourself on that day especially.